Spiegel. I'm an EM critical care physician in Washington, D.C. And what we're going to talk about today is post-arrest care. What is the optimal blood pressure and does it exist? And so again, I don't have any financial disclosures intellectually. I have many biases when they do become important. I'll try to let you know in this presentation. But we're going to start with this idea that this is a cautionary tale, the idea of managing, a, trying to identify a specific blood pressure in a specific population. And it's the problem of tangibility bias or tangible bias or the ability just because you can measure something, you're more likely to focus on it and more likely to intervene on it. And so what we're talking about here is MAP. What is the ideal MAP in people who have been resuscitated post out of hospital cardiac arrest? And the theory here is when we are functioning at our ideal state, our brain has a large range of auto-regulation where we can control the blood flow based on wide ranges of actual blood pressure. Meaning if your blood pressure is low, if your blood pressure is normal, the blood pressure is high, the brain is still seeing the same amount of perfusion because of the ability to vasodilate and vasoconstrict. And as you get to critical levels, critically high blood pressures or critically low blood pressures, that ability to autoregulate starts to be harmed. But in an injured brain, in a brain that no longer has this ability to autoregulate, it actually sees the blood pressure that the patient has systemically. And so it's far more vulnerable to low blood pressures in patients with brain injury. And so the concept here is Maybe in patients with post-cardiac arrest that have brain injuries, we should have a higher blood pressure to encourage perfusion because the brain is no longer able to autoregulate and protect itself and maintain a blood flow even with lower maps. And so this theory was initially looked at in a number of like retrospective studies where they compared essentially patients with lower maps to higher maps and found that patients with higher maps post-ROS had better outcomes, better survival, better neurological outcomes. The problem with this data is most of it was retrospective or observational data. It's confounded with the idea that patients who are just able to have higher maps because they have a less critically ill state are obviously going to do pa- better than the patients that are in shock. Meaning, yes, patients with higher blood pressures will do better, but it doesn't exactly mean controlling that blood pressure was the actual outcome that mattered. Rather, you were just identifying a healthier group of patients. And so since then, there's been three small randomized control trials that looked at comparing a lower blood pressure target to a slightly higher blood pressure target and really found that there was no difference in outcomes that they noticed, whether people having a MAP push, if you'd say, led to better outcomes. But most notably, is the recent trial that was published this year, blood pressure targets and comatose survivors and cardiac arrest. So this was a large randomized trial looking just at this question. And what they did was they randomized 789 patients, and these patients were post-ROSC for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And they were randomized to a MAP target of 63 or a MAP target of 77. And what they did was fascinating. The way they did this and the way they were able to blind their clinicians, they essentially fiddled with their machine. And so all physicians were basically told to keep a map of 70. That was the map they were trying to maintain. And then they adjusted the machine either up or down, meaning while the clinician saw 70, the map was really 63 in the low group, while the physician saw 70, the map was really 77 in the high group. And so they allowed to actually maintain blindness despite just fiddling with the maps, which up until now was something that was pretty hard to do because most of the time you were just setting where uh, the map should be and the clinician saw what the actual map was. And so they found they did a pretty good job. You can see there is definitely a difference between the patients in the high versus low map group. And, and you actually can see that actually to get the patients to a higher map required more norepinephrine dosing. And then they use something called the vasoinotropic score, which is simply a way of looking at the amount of vasopressors and inotropes that were used. And again, you see here that patients in the high map group required higher vasopressive and higher inotrope doses to maintain appropriate MAP. Now, they looked at a couple things. The first was deaths. The primary outcome was deaths or severe disability at 90 days. And this was a Glasgow outcome scale of three or four. So essentially, you were severely disabled or dead at 90 days. And you can see there was really no difference between the two groups, 32% and and 34% in the 63 and 77 groups respectively. You also say when they looked at 90-day survival, again, no real difference between the two groups. And you also notice that the majority of their primary outcome, if you go back, 
to 90 day death or severe disability is mostly deaths. There wasn't that many survivors with poor neurological outcome. Most of these patients passed away at 90 days. And so where does this leave us? This is going back to this idea of tangibility bias and why I don't think any of these studies ever that's trying to identify an ideal map for an ideal population will ever prove to be successful. And in fact, if you look at any of these studies, whether you're looking at sepsis, cardiac arrest, any other disease state, and you're trying to identify an ideal map for that population, they've never been effective. And that's because map might not be the ideal way of actually treating these patients. It's just the one that we can look at quite frequently and actually easily, right? And so this is the concept of what is MAP. And we often use MAP as a surrogate for perfusion, right? When we see MAP, we think it's actually telling us what is happening at the patient's organs and are they perfusing. The problem is it's not that at all. It's not a great surrogate perfusion depending on the patient you look in front of us. And we often basically get confused between MAP being a marker of the macro circulation or the macro hemodynamics versus perfusion being a marker of the micro hemodynamics. So what do I mean by that? MAP is obviously determined by your cardiac output and your SVR, right? And this basically, what is the global blood pressure throughout your system, right? We use MAP because we think it's more representative of perfusion versus systolic or diastolic blood pressure. But if you go to the microcirculatory system, what is perfusion? Essentially, it is a product of your central arterial pressure, which we're using our MAP, or venous pressure, which we often use the CVP, and the resistance in the system. And this resistance is not constant throughout the system, right? Different organs have different resistance, meaning different organs are getting different perfusion, right? A good extreme example of this is Reboa, right? When you put a Reboa in, and let's just say in this case, we decide it's a good idea to put a Reboa in a patient with sepsis. We inflate the balloon, we increase systemic vascular resistance incredibly high, right? And we are able to increase the MAP and perfusion of the organs above the level of the balloon. That's what Reboa does. But Below the level of the balloon, we've, de- we've increased vascular res- resistance so high that we've basically reduced perfusion to zero. Now, this is an extreme example, but this is essentially what's happening at every organ bed throughout disease states. And different disease states have different levels of resistance at various organs, right? So sepsis is a great example. Sepsis is a vasodilatory state. So the actual resistance at the organ beds is very low. Now, if you go back from a macro perfusion state, this means your systemic vascular resistance is low, decreasing your MAP. But if you look at perfusion, especially early on in sepsis, perfusion to the organs is actually quite good and sometimes even hot. You change this to a state of like hemorrhagic shock where basically the body is clamping down its less important organs to try to maintain MAP and maintain perfusion to the brain and to the heart, right? And so while MAP is high because an increase in systemic vascular resistance, the perfusion to certain organ beds are low. And so there's an uncoupling of your hemo or your macro hemodynamics and your micro hemodynamics. And so we have to think about this on every single patient. Now, the problem with these studies is all patients are snowflakes. There's no single patient that exists the same. Even in a group of patients that all have out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, there's multiple phenotypes. You're seeing people with cardiogenic shock. You're seeing people that have a whopping inflammatory response and have a vasodilatory shock. You're seeing people who exist with no real shock at all, and mostly you're just dealing with a brain injury. And then you're seeing all these disease states in small amounts mixed in with different patients. And not only that, you're seeing people at different times in their disease states. So a patient that comes in with a anoxic brain injury on day one has far less swelling than that same patient on day four. And so trying to identify a specific map for a specific patient population is always just going to be a futile approach. So what do we do with that? What is the ideal map? Like I said, there is no ideal map, but obviously logistically while you're in the ICU, you need to tell the nurses to monitor to a certain map and you need to maintain some standards. And so the way I look at it, since none of these things are perfect and a map of 65, which is we generally use is based on just as little evidence as a map of 85. But what you can see from all these studies, your rate of iatrogenicity or your need to give medications and treatments and fluid boluses and inotropes and pressors is far lower when you're maintaining a map of 65 empirically than when you're maintaining a map of 85. So I tend to think 
if you're going to empirically pick a number, a map of 65 is as good as any other. But you have to keep in mind that a map is not telling you perfusion. And you're allowed to modify it depending on the patient in front of you and what you're seeing with the various organ beds and signs of hypoperfusion. So that wraps us up. I don't think there's any evidence showing that using higher maps or slower maps is empirically and or better in patients without a hospital cardiac arrest. I think if you're just going to have to pick a number, the lower one leads to less treatment, needless treatments, and so it's probably safer. But understanding that MAP is not the best representation of perfusion, and depending on the disease state that the patient has, you'll have more or less uncoupling of your macro and micro hemodynamics. Thank you.